Thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm really impressed to see this many people in the room this late in the day on a topic as unexciting as knowledge, man. <laughs> um, I know that there's a certain sort of like dread that certain people feel about a topic like this. It's like, you know, like the study of librarians or something. Um, what, no offense to librarians. Um, but what Mac and I want to try to do today is convince you that that's the exact opposite of the way of how you should think about knowledge management. That really, um, it's one of the things that's going to differentiate uh, really successful companies uh, from those who are less successful uh, in the future in this model-driven world that we're moving to, and that this is a real deep source of competitive advantage. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about why we believe that, some of the challenges that we see, uh, and then um, we'll talk about uh, some of our frameworks for how we think about it. We'll try to make it as practical as possible. Um, just quickly to introduce myself, my name is Matthew Grenade. Uh, I, as Southern said, I'm, I work at uh, Point72, which is a hedge fund um, and a Domino client. I'm also a co-founder of Domino with Nick and Chris. Uh, and then before that, and one of the things uh, Mac and I will be, both be drawing on today, I was uh, co-head of research at Bridgewater Associates, which is a large uh, global macro hedge fund that really, I think, did knowledge management in an exceedingly thoughtful way. And we'll talk about some of that. It's actually how Mac and I know each other. Um, before I get started, I'll uh, have Mac introduce himself as well. If you guys haven't already gotten to know him from his three trips to the stage. All right, well, the, you guys are probably getting tired of me at this stage, but I'm Mac. Uh, I do uh, director of product here at Domino, and Matthew's generous. He was my boss's boss at Bridgewater, but uh, yeah, we're excited to have this conversation, and thank you for sticking through what on the surface does appear to be a dry topic, but I promise we'll make it as interesting as we can. Cool. Uh, so anyway, this is the agenda, this is what I said. We'll talk a little bit about uh, what insight is, like why knowledge management matters, uh, then Max can talk about some of the challenges and some of the challenges unique to data science and knowledge management, and then we'll share a little bit of uh, some of our frameworks and things like that for how we've put in place knowledge management solutions. Um, so let me just start with the you know the question of what is insight, um, and you know I think that's a it's a, a pretty important question because ultimately, you know you have to sort of figure out in, with knowledge management what are you trying to capture, uh, and and my view is that what you're trying to capture is insight. Um, and so what I, what I propose here is sort of a definition of that, which is better understanding. Um, and I like that definition because it's inherently relative. And the idea is that, um, you know, that you have one idea and then you have a better idea and what you're trying to understand and what you're trying to do is sort of take your ideas and constantly make them better. So, you know, if you think about an example, you know, Copernicus had better understanding because he knew that planets circled the sun. Um, and, you know, that was better than the geocentric model that came before it. Uh, and that, you know, th basically at every step you want to have something that, you know, the data uh, it, it better explains um, and actually captures that knowledge. Um, and so, you know, one of the really important questions, if you, if you believe in insight and you believe in the power of insight, is where does it come from? And uh, there's a pretty popular myth, or what I would call a myth, um, that, uh, that, you know, insight comes from the lone genius. And so I have some good pictures of lone geniuses. You know, so this is Einstein smoking his pipe. Uh, this is Freud smoking a cigar. Uh, this is uh, Faulkner smoking a pipe. Um, so insight either comes from lone geniuses or smoking or both. Um, we're, not, <laughs> we're not sure which it is, but you know, this, is, this is what geniuses do. Um, and you know, what I would tell you is that in my experience in the financial industry, you know, working in hedge funds and quantitative hedge funds, um, that's pretty wrong. Um, that, that most uh, insight comes from some sort of collective. Um, comes from some sort of working together, some sort of collaboration. Um, and I think that, um, that Newton really nailed this um, when he said, you know, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, and, you know, what I, what I really like about this is that it, um, it really captures this idea of, of compounding. Um, and it, it captures this idea that, you know, he took everything that was known before him, he accessed it somehow, um, and then he was able to build upon it. And I think about when I, when I build my data science organizations uh, and teams of quants and things like that, um, you know, what I'm trying to do is enable them to stand on the shoulders of everybody who's come before them. Uh, and that, that for me is really the, the purpose of knowledge management. And what you're really trying to do there is, is kind of get that compounding machine going. So, you know, if I were to, if I were to try to make that concrete for a second, um, you know, I think one of the industries that has done knowledge management in a very interesting way and really sort of captured this, 
this idea of compounding is the airline industry, um, which I, you know, might have many of you scratching your heads. But uh, until actually very recently, uh, when there was the accident on the Southwest Airlines flight, um, you know, airlines in the U.S. had not had a major catastrophe for I think almost uh, eight or nine years, um, and and well, even even a minor catastrophe. There had been sort of no passenger deaths. And a lot of that comes about because of their knowledge management systems. And in particular, they use checklists. And I think checklists are sort of a great conceptual framework of what knowledge management is about. And if you think about what the airline industry did, and there's a great book on this called The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande, um, who's a surgeon. Uh, but what they did was they wrote down essentially how things should be done. Uh, and you know, if you have this type of emergency, this is what you do. And if you had this type of emergency, this is what you do. And they lived with those things every day. And they trained the pilots to follow the checklist. And then most importantly, when things didn't work or when they had a chance to try out the checklist, things like that, they would revise it. Um, but what's really powerful about that was they had, a, they had a framework for capturing their knowledge. They had a framework then to live by and follow. And then they had a loop back constantly uh, as they would experience things and they had a, a mechanism for improving it. And so, you know, that is, that in my mind, you know, if you want to sort of uh, kind of get outside the technical solutions and things like that for knowledge management, that's really what you're trying to do. You're trying to create a compounding machine that, that is constantly capturing these insights and letting you get better and better. Um, and for those of you who were at Nick's speech earlier this morning, you know, if you, if you think about a couple of the examples he gave, you know, whether it be Netflix or Amazon, um, you know, I think, um, I think both of those are, are really good examples of model-driven companies, but they're also examples of companies that are using knowledge management and building upon what they've done in incremental ways to get better and better. I mean, that's how Netflix's recommender engine has gotten as good as it's gotten. It wasn't sort of one swoop, it was little improvements day by day. Uh, and similarly, you know, in, the, in the, if the quote that Nick put up from Jeff Bezos, the second paragraph of that, you know, about the, the things you don't see, that's sort of a very similar thing. Um, at Bridgewater, where uh, we, were, we were a global macro hedge fund, fully systematic, so we had a code base um, that was how we sort of traded the markets, um, we had a very explicit goal. We had a goal that said, every year we're going to try to make that knowledge in there 8 to 9% better. Um, and, uh, and that was sort of the idea of, of what the research team was doing. The research team was compounding the knowledge we had and trying to make it some degree better every year. Um, so that, for me, is really how I think about kind of the, the core purpose of knowledge management. And I think it's really powerful because a lot of the other um, sources of advantage in data science have started to erode. So, you know, algorithms and infrastructure, you know, there's so much now available via open source, there's so much infrastructure available, um, you know, that's not really a, a potent source of advantage. Um, people are a unique asset, but, you know, all the data science programs are scaling. Um, I know all of us struggle with hiring, but the fact is there are a lot of data scientists in the world and they're more and more being created. Um, and data, in some cases, is a source of competitive advantage, especially if it's proprietary, but um, that's not always the case. Uh, and more in, uh, in, in more and more industries, you're seeing requirements around sharing data. Um, so, you know, like the open, open banking and things like that. Um, so if you really think about it as a, as a, you know, as a data scientist, what's going to be the source of advantage, I think a lot of it comes back to um, being able to drive a, um, a, a knowledge process that is constantly capturing what's important uh, and is then able to compound upon that in, in really smart ways. So um, that's kind of the introduction uh, to kind of, uh, you know, what knowledge management really is in mine and Max's mind uh, and why it matters. Uh, and now Max can talk a little bit about some of the challenges uh, and why this is so hard. Thanks, Matthew. Oop. You forgot your compounding chart. Oh. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what compounding interest looks like, this is what compounding interest looks like. Uh, little differences make a big difference over time. And then you forgot this one, too, which is also one of the best, Warren Buffett basically saying how powerful compound interest is. So again, this is the reason we bring this up is because we think of compounding, the way you achieve compounding in this world is through knowledge management. And as we said, and we've made this joke a few times though, it's not a sexy thing. It has a lot of connotations of bureaucracy. Elena mentioned that in the last panel. And I think the sort of quote I've always heard is death by SharePoint. Uh, and there's lots of false promises of the, like, the sort of next solution for data science, or for knowledge management, but 
we have all these unfulfilled hopes, and why is that? And I think at its core, no matter what domain you're in, whether you're in sales, whether you are in marketing, whether you're an engineer, there are some challenges around knowledge management that are universal. Uh, first, it's really hard to organize your knowledge in advance. Like You don't know exactly what is going to be important, and so you end up coming up with these taxonomies that end up being too rigid. There's very few examples of like great taxonomies that have like stood the test of time. The like kingdom phylum, blah blah blah. I think that, that's a great one. But like more often in business, those don't work so well. Uh, for, you have little incentive to participate if you are the person in uh, sort of on in the trenches. I mean, a great quote from a data scientist was that I get paid for what I build this year, not maintaining what I built last year. And so no one is really incentivized to do this well. And even if we all agree that it would be better, like the it's a sort of a classic collective action problem. No one wants to be the first mover. Uh, even if you find the work that was done, uh, it's hard to use it. So I, there was another quote, if you noticed it, uh, there was a lot of those quotes on Nick's slide this morning about like, uh, we build our headquarters faster than we get a model into production. There was one in the corner, which was like, the wiki is where good ideas go to die. Uh, and I think that that is, there's, it's telling, not because I don't like wikis, uh, but more because it's sometimes really hard to know what to do with it and if you can actually take action on that knowledge. And the last one is that systems always lag reality. Uh, too often data sci or knowledge management systems are a separate system. It's not where I actually spend my day. Uh, Jacob Grada, who was the keynote speaker yesterday morning from Moody's Analytics, he said this really well. He, the way he described it to me was, he's like, listen, with every click and every minute from where you did your work, the quality of your documentation and your knowledge management degrades exponentially. And so that means that if you have to go two clicks over on your tabs or you have to spend a minute before you can then go document, much less spend a month, you try and do it a month later, you are going to document things really poorly, no matter what domain you're in. And to make it even harder, and the, right, I, the reason there's a picture of kids soccer in here is because this is a little bit like everyone around the ball, it's sort of chaos. It's even worse in data science. And there's a couple of unique characteristics of data science that make knowledge management even harder. First is that if you have different tools, that tends to mean that you have different teams. And so the R people are over here, the Python people are over here, the SAS people are over here, and so help you God if you try and get those people to work together. Uh, even within a single team, people prefer different tools. Some people will use Git. Other people will just store things in, uh, store their code and email it, which I know sounds terrible, but people still do it. And all these, a single team will have many different systems across which their work is strewn. If you do take the time to sort of train people, the, pro the, the turnover in the industry, uh, as I said, for those of you who are in an earlier session, median t uh, tenure of a data scientist, less than two years. That makes it really hard to, people. if people get good over time, they're gonna leave before they actually are really great at knowledge management. And then the work of a single project is scattered. You have, maybe you have, some, uh, you have things in Docker, uh, you've got a Docker store, you've got, your source rep repos, you've got your wiki, you've got some PowerPoint presentations you've shared with stakeholders. There's so many different things strewn across the system that encompass a single project. And last, this is particularly the case in data science, even if you have the code, you might not necessarily be able to rerun the code. And there's an academic study out there that I think was a meta-analysis, which is really illustrates this point well. They went and they took 600 different pa academic papers from computational research, and they said, okay, let's, only goal we have, rerun this code. What percentage do you guys think actually reran? I, I, I'm curious, I want to uh, uh, shout out an answer. I see 5%, any, any, anyone more? In eight, 10, anyone else? All right, who said 20, because 20 was right. 20, uh, there you go, all right. Mr. Peter Dvorak in the back. Um, and so, did I tell you that? Um, no. <laughs> uh, no, so, and the crazy thing was, 20% is already cr like an insanely low number, but of the 20% that ran, a lot of them didn't re have the exact same results. So they were using slightly different versions of the R package or something like that. And so that's the thing that's terrifying in the world of data science. And so 
what do we do about it? So a lot of what we're talking about, oh, this is you. Oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you're coming back. OK, yeah, that's fine. We're going, it's like a duet, so. <laughs> so in terms of what to do about it, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, a few thoughts, and then Max is going to take us into more detail in, through the framework. Um, so, so first off, um, you know, these are some of the steps that we think are you know, really important as you think about knowledge management. Um, you got to first think about you know, capturing the greatest share of knowledge that you can um, and, you know, and the importance of a common platform. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of our thoughts about that here in a second. Um, I mean, this is one of the true pain points because, as Max said, you know, one of the mistakes people make is knowledge management is something that's done not where the work is. Uh, and when you do it that way, it gets, makes it very hard to sort of pull the work back in. Um, but we'll talk about that. Uh, second is you want to make it so that you can discover the, as much work as possible. And so, you know, a little bit if you do the first thing, it becomes much easier to then do the second thing. Um, the third and fourth steps, though, are, are uh, truly more difficult. One is preserving the provenance so that you have the context. So what were you really trying to do there? Um, what, what really matters? Um, what, what, what were the learnings? What, were the, what was the synthesis? What was the context? Um, then reuse. I mean, this ties exactly to what Mac was just talking about in terms of um, actually being able to rerun things and, and have things work. Um, and then finally, uh, decomposing. Um, so, you know, we think any good knowledge management system would have all those pieces. And we'll give you some tests uh, to run here in a second to ask in your own organizations about whether or not um, those, uh, whether or not you're, you're sort of doing well on each of these dimensions. One of the really critical things, though, that you have to decide is what are you going, like, what is your unit of knowledge? Like, what, what, what is it that matters? Um, you know, it, part of how you build a compounding system is you have a unit of knowledge uh, that that makes sense and that works. You know, universities do that generally via papers and books, and this is a nice picture of a big library. Uh, and if you think about you know how how universities work, it's that you know things get written down, uh, and if they don't if they weren't written down, then they don't really count. Uh, and then that allows for others to read them and compound upon them. Um, you know, similarly in software, uh, you know the the you know the unit is code, uh, and so code repositories like GitHub and things like that are very very powerful. Um, in data science, uh, you know, as you can tell from uh, Nick's speech and others, you know, our, our view is that it's the model, um, and the model is the right thing to organize around uh, because it's the it's the thing that, that data scientists make. It's what they create. Um, it's also a fully operable unit, so uh, it, you know it, it does the work. Um, and you know, by model, we mean sort of uh, kind of all the different pieces, right? We mean the data, the code, the parameters, the results, um, and you have to sort of make sure that you're sort of organizing around the right level. Uh, and so again, what, what you'll sort of see throughout the rest of this is, um, uh, it, you know, is this idea of the model being the right level of organization. Uh, and you know, then when you, when you sort of think about how you, um, how you approach this, you know, we think there are technology levers, we think there are, are process level levers and people levers, uh, and that really the, the firms that do this best sort of come at it from all those different angles. Um, I think one of the classic mistakes that people make is they think that knowledge management uh, is, a, is, a, is a technology problem, that I'm going to buy a piece of software and it's going to solve all my problems. Um, you really have to come at it from all, the, all these different angles. So what we're going to do now is um, Max is going to take you through kind of each of the pieces of the framework uh, kind of in a little more depth and give you some tests. And then I'm going to come back and share some general thoughts on uh, process and people changes that you can make uh, here in a second. All right. So. Five-step framework, they, as I said, late in the afternoon on the second day, it's a conceptual topic. We wanted to give you guys some actual tactical tests, things that you can do tomorrow if you're ambitious and going back to work tomorrow, more likely on Monday. Uh, first thing, capture it. Capture everything. Uh, the way we think about knowledge management systems is that the value of your knowledge management system follows Metcalfe's law. It's like a network. The more things in there, uh, the more connections you have across it, the value grows that way. And as a result, you don't really want people operating in the fringes, in the shadows. There was a large financial organization that we worked with. Uh, they did an uh, internal Kaggle competition, had 350 people sign up, which was awesome. There was 30 people that showed up that were writing Python code that the IT team and the model inventory team had literally never seen before. And it was actually their HR analytics team, like, these people do data science? They had no idea. And so none of the work that those people had done, and 
a lot of it was quite valuable. A lot of those things could have been used completely isolated from the rest of the organization. Um, if a model is built in a silo and no one sees it, it's a little bit like if a tree falls in the forest, I would argue that no one cares. It doesn't actually make that much of a difference. And the other thing that we've seen organizations do really well is keep track of the ideas that are generated, even if you end up discarding it. This is a thing that at Bridgewater we were quite disciplined about. There was a really robust idea generation process, and so you might generate 20 ideas in one meeting, and those would be documented, people would be assigned to follow up on them, and you'd figure out, is there fruit here or not? It, sort of a little bit like what the panel was discussing. It doesn't have to be a full-blown model, but is there a thing here that merits further investigation? And if it was no, it's not like we tossed that on the floor. It was, okay, let's make sure that we save that so it turns out that we don't actually care about Turkish inflation right now, but maybe we will sometime in the future. And so if you wanna test this, get a, a sense of how well you're doing this, here's a thing that I've seen people do well. So ask, take five people in your company, even in, even in your own group, and independently ask them. Don't ask them in a room, because then they'll all be biased, but ask them independently, how many projects do you think this team is doing right now? And chances are you will get five different answers. And the, that's okay, uh, because it, that's pretty common, but the person who actually does have an idea about all the different projects happening, that's probably the person you should start with and sort of work from them, because they have the best visibility. In terms of discovery, there's a couple different ways to think about this. So uh, for those of you who are sort of thought about knowledge management, uh, it's often called the Yahoo versus Google uh, approach, which is like, should you curate your knowledge uh, versus just like index it? Uh, curation makes sense when the domain is reasonably stable. So what countries should we do business in? Uh, that probably doesn't change that frequently. Uh, and the person who curates that is often the person who is able to, uh, we think of that person almost like a librarian, and that role is probably an unsung hero, uh, and chances are it's you, the data science leader, who should be doing that job first. Eventually, as your team grows, it will become, it could become an independent standalone role, but at the beginning, it doesn't make a ton of sense. It's probably a job of the data science leader. And the reason this is important, and this is a shocking statistic from McKinsey, that most knowledge workers spend 1.8 hours of their day just searching and gathering information. And let's all be real, we say it's an eight hour work day, people go to the bathroom, there's other things. Like That's probably a third of your productive time lost to just searching and gathering information. And I would guess that for a data scientist, it's almost higher, just given the different systems across which all of this is strewn. So the other approach for this is search which is the domain is fluid, I can't possibly know uh, beforehand what the taxonomy should look like, so let's just index it all. And this is a thing that we've seen people do well where they're indexing discussion, they're indexing the presentations, they're indexing all of these things. I think the knowledge repo at Airbnb is a really cool example of this. And so that stuff's really important because you never know exactly what you might wanna search. Somebody might just wanna search fraud and see what comes up, uh, and that's a little bit the Google approach. And so if you wanna test for this, uh, find a new person who's joined your team. Most of you are probably hiring. Uh, if you're not, that's uh, probably a different sign. And so <laughs> uh, and figure out how long it takes that person to find a new topic. So they join the team, give them a couple weeks, but say, I want you to work on churn. I want you to work on fraud. I want you to work on something. And just see if it takes them, how long it takes them to gather those relevant artifacts. Because if it takes them weeks or months, that should be a red flag that something is not going right. This is, as Matthew said, the first steps, fairly obvious, or at least, uh, uh, maybe not obvious, but at least not as hard. This is where it gets really hard. Provenance, and I, I always describe this, your fourth grade math teacher was right. The answer matters a lot less than showing your work. Uh, and so what we've seen is that basically people should be able to do what they do best. So I've got a long experimental tray. I've tried 100 different things. I've filled the nulls. I've dropped my outliers. I've done all these different things, all this feature engineering. 
I shouldn't have to replicate every, I shouldn't have to say everything, I, every single step. I should be able to synthesize. Like, let people do what people do best, which is synthesize. Ideally, don't trust them to keep track of anything else. Like, they shouldn't be able to keep track of which version of pandas they were using. Uh, that probably is just not a good use of their time. People have a limited cognitive load to handle knowledge management. At least let them focus on the things that matter. One way that we've seen this work well in a good test is what per, like ask somebody what percentage of their time is on documentation. And if the answer is zero, that's a flag. I think Elena did bring up a fair question of there may be some corner cases where it possibly is justified to do this, but I think that's an open debate. But more often, people spend it at the end of the project. They're looking back and be like, oh, trying to remember what they did and sort of forensically reconstruct the process. So ask people, ask a few different people, and write down beforehand what you think it should be. So I, Warby Parker had a great slide uh, at one of our pop-ups about six months ago, which was like, how data scientists think they spend their time versus how data scientists actually spend their time. And people didn't actually, it, People thought that they should be doing all this thing on modeling. How the manager wanted them spending their time was significantly on documentation. So write it down ahead of time, do the test. I think you'll be surprised by the results. Reuse. Uh, as I said, if it won't run, it won't get reused. Uh, the academic study I mentioned is really important. Uh, in terms of data science, there's uh, code repositories are great, but there's a whole nother unit and artifact that comes bundled into your data science project called the data. And the data is very important to understanding what you did. So think about storing that. Uh, it does it, like, or at least think about preserving the query that you wrote to pull it from a database. And if you really set it up well, you're using append-only databases where you could say, I ran this query at this time, and you could play history backwards and get that exact data set. It, too often, people don't keep track of the underlying data they used. And as it moves through that data science life cycle, by the time you go try and by the time it's done, no one knows where you started and all the transformations you made along the way. And as you're doing it, think about answering this question. Like, what's changed? What has changed since we did this? And the test I would propose to you, this is probably the hardest test of all, is Find something that somebody did six months ago, at least six months ago. Even better if that person has now left your organization or has gone to a different team. Ask someone who's joined, a competent data scientist, to reproduce that work, and then ask them to update it with the most recent data. First off, they'll give you a death stare, because it's everyone's least favorite question. But after they've gotten over it, they'll go try to do it. And what you'll realize is that if that takes them a week, a month, that is a big red flag. And so that's a great test that we've seen people do. You should be able to do this with absolute minimal pain. Last one, and I realize I reused an image and I apologize for that. Uh, decompose and modularize. This came up in the panel before this, which was how do you ensure that people are incentivized to do this and how do you think about these, this building block idea. So there's a couple things that we've seen people do this well. Uh, as you go through the process, flag the things that are helpful. In code reviews, expect that people will say, hey, that little backtesting utility that you wrote, super useful. Let's expose that for other people. Those features, you built a great um, feature for customer engagement over the last three months. Like, that should be a thing that we use over and over. Uh, we talked about this at Bridgewater. There's like a good example of this and a bad example of this. At Bridgewater, we had like 17 different uh, ways of doing seasonal adjustment. And that was insane. Like, no one used the same one. It ended up being like the models were always slightly off because the seasonal adjustment was different. And eventually we realized that was, in, like, that was a bad way of working, and so people Thought we need modular components that people can take off the shelf and build. And so we ended up creating a thing that was a repository of all of our best estimates of certain key indicators. It's a little bit like a feature store. And not only did it have the things which are accessible to everyone, but it also showed you who had built it, 
when it had been evaluated. They gave it a score of one to 10 of reliability, and they gave comments and uh, get left feedback about things that you should be mindful of. Oh, trust this data from 2000 onwards, from 1980 to 1990, it's a little sketchy. Those types of things were invaluable so that everyone else could then take those and build on them to make much more complex things. So the test I would suggest here, you probably have data, assuming you have a data science team of a decent size, there's probably been two teams that have worked on something fairly similar. Uh, two marketing projects, two lead scoring projects. Have them both post-mortem their process and think about the overlapping work and sort of say, could you have used this thing? Was it a, this sort of almost a 90% correlation to the artifact that was used over here that was rebuilt entirely over here? Most often people don't even think that the thing that they're building is that is shared, but most of the time we're not special snowflakes. A lot of this is re recombining similar artifacts into different domains. And so that's a really powerful test that I think a lot of organizations can find illuminating. I'll give it back to Matthew to give some thoughts on people in process because he's, he managed more people than I did. <laughs> um, so just to uh, kind of close out, I wanted to talk a little bit about process and a little bit about people. Um, the one, uh, you know, on, on process I would make uh, two big points. One is, you know, the, a few slides ago we said capture everything. Um, and I would actually take exception to capture everything because I think that, uh, I mean obviously that's better than, than, uh, than various alternatives, but it sort of makes the whole problem more daunting than it should be. Um, and what I would say is start by capturing the very most valuable thing. Um, and if you really, wanna, you really wanna create an insight machine, you really wanna create a compounding machine, identify what is the absolute most uh, valuable model or knowledge in your organization and commit to building a system around that. Um, that's really, you know, if I think about why Bridgewater was able to do what it was able to do, um, it was that uh, it, it sort of started there. It started with this idea that certain models were used to trade the markets. There was all sorts of work and research that went on beyond that, but there were certain models were used to touch the markets and that those would be treated um, you know, like the most valuable books in the library, you know, like the most valuable scrolls in, an, in an, uh, sort of an ancient religion or something. Um, we had a whole team dedicated to just making sure that those models were properly coded. They were actually all, uh, often coded in multiple uh, different situations that so you could kind of understand them. They were fully documented. They were watched every day. They were, they were managed as beautifully as possible. Um, and then what you wanted to do as you sort of saw that was you wanted to add that same level of knowledge management to other things, and so that's how seasonal adjustment gets uh, fixed. But my advice would be to start with something very, very valuable and really commit to doing it. Um, that's point number one. Point number two on process, I think, is what you're really needing to do, though, is, is change how people think about um, what their jobs are and what they're trying to do. And the framework that I like to think about is codify, do, learn. Um, and what most people spend their time doing, if you think about like doctors or something like that, they spend most of their time doing. Um, and uh, you know, to really sort of get a knowledge system going, you have to start, you know, if you go back to the airline example, well, what's the checklist that we're going to do if the plane suddenly depressurizes? You have to then run that checklist, you have to look at what happened and did it work, and then you have to sort of give feedback to that, that code and correct it. Um, so you're really having to fairly dramatically change how people think about what their workflow is and what their job is. And so again, if you sort of put my point, my first point together with my second point, it's, you know, I would sort of pick the models that are absolutely most valuable for your business and really make sure that they are codified, that then they are running and that you're learning from them. Um, and that's a very hard thing to do. I mean, I was, <clears throat> I was at a panel uh, a few weeks ago and somebody was talking about uh, research that had been done in the healthcare industry, and one of the big tech firms had bought uh, all the healthcare data they could put their hands on, uh, and they turned out they couldn't do anything with the healthcare data because there was no output, there was no impact uh, data in it. All they had was a bunch of activities, and so they couldn't see what was working and what wasn't working. And you know, this is an industry that's, you know, I think four trillion dollars or something like that, uh, and you know, and th and they they haven't even been able to structure in a codified do learn sort of way. Um, so it's a big challenge. My advice is uh, to start with the most valuable models your firm has. Um, finally, just on people, um, you know, a, a few things. One is I think um, in data science we often, in hiring, we undervalue uh, collaboration. 
Uh, we put a lot of value on skills and training. Um, and the firms that we work with that do the best work uh, uh, put collaboration both in the hiring process uh, and do an interview focused on collaboration, and they put uh, collaboration in the compensation process. Uh, meaning that you know one of the things that they think about when they give bonuses is how collaborative was this person with other people. Um, second uh, is, and again, it goes back to the compensation process, um, rewarding people who are component builders and people who are curators. So people who um, actually, you know, uh, document their work well and um, build modules that others can use and you know uh, kind of th those sorts of knowledge management type things um, you know you have to keep metrics on it and if you keep metrics on it and you then connect that to compensation you know as you might expect people then start to do more of it um, and then finally and and you know I have some mixed feelings about this last piece of advice but it's to create new roles um, and the reason I have mixed feelings is I, I think the first two points are a little bit more important, which is you want everybody thinking this way, you want this in everybody's uh, incentives. Um, but I do think, you know, we've seen in, in a lot of organizations that there is a role for like a librarian or a facilitator of these sorts of things. So someone who, you know, points out opportunities to create a new, new module. So it might be to create the seasonal adjustment algorithm. Um, but I think it's very important that the, the work of knowledge management not get passed to the librarian, that it's really everyone's job. And that the librarian and roles like that are helping facilitate make that happen, making that happen. Um, so uh, that's pretty much all we had to say. Um, you know, it was it was interesting. Uh, uh, it was actually when I was driving over here, I saw on Twitter a quote that said, "All great fortunes, wealth, relationships, and knowledge come from compounding." Um, and I, you know, I was realized like that's pretty much exactly what we wanted to tell you guys today, which is certainly, uh, you know. Um, fortunes related to knowledge come from compounding, and we really think that knowledge management is the building block of that. So um, hope that helps, and appreciate you uh, listening. We have time. Yeah, we have questions. Yeah, we have time for like five questions or five minutes for questions. I think. Okay. Thanks. That was really interesting. Um, really agree that you know writing good documentation and modularization can be relatively thankless. Uh, and incentivizing it seems like a really great solution. I was wondering if you have any best practices around uh, how you might be able to do that. I saw in the demo earlier you had like you know this component that you have built you know has been reused X number of times. Um, but in particular, like best practices around incentivizing it in a productive way so that people don't gamify it or you know Thoughts? that makes sense. You well, I'll do documentation. You want to do modularization? I'll do documentation? Sure. Uh, from a modularization standpoint, I mean, obviously, the demo we showed this morning has some of value of that. I think what we've, I think one of the models that we think about, if we said that data science is more like research, how do they do it in research? Uh, Elena kind of stole my thunder when she said this, but she was like, think about that, the academic system of citation. Uh, they actually have the H index, which is the thing that tracks how different citations are used across uh, academic papers and sort of it's almost like a power rankings of academics and I don't think that it, it it's hard to do that but I think that is a good conceptual framework of okay where are these things getting imported I think there's ways you can to some extent do this with GitHub I agree that game of ga it can be gamed and so uh, I think that there has to be a sort of good intent and uh, uh, behind all of it but I think that this is it's so new, and I think that, and the one point that we didn't bring up, but I think is important, is that this doesn't really become the most important thing for a data science team until they cross like 15 data scientists. If you talk to teams of data scientists of like five or less, they're kind of like, eh, knowledge management, I got bigger fish to fry. Teams of like five to 15, they're like, oh, I'm starting to see some, some smoke that might suggest this is a problem, but I have other bigger fires. Once you get past 15, it's like, this is your biggest fire. And so I think that it really depends that not that many teams have come far to it. So I think this, the best practice and the technology to solve it is still being written, which is sort of an underwhelming answer. I appreciate it. I think on documentation, I mean, I'd have two thoughts. Um, one is, and this is uh, somewhat controversial, but uh, when, when people present work to me for final sign off, I require them to do it in the form of a memo. Um, and they generally hate that until they 
like that, or maybe they hate that until they leave. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, the reason I do that is um, we then, I mean, that it's, a, it's a massive treasure trove of knowledge. Um, it also clarifies their thinking and forces them to synthesize. It puts everybody sort of into a similar framework. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of sort of love hate to it, but um, uh, you know, you basically make that sort of documentation uh, kind of stand in the way of them being done, uh, and um, and then you ultimately uh, you get it. <laughs> and you know, it's it's similar on other types of documentation. You know, whether it be like um, you know the, the the more detailed technical documentation and things like that. You know, if you think about the uh, the models I was talking about the, at Bridgewater, the models that touch the money. Um, you know, you, you basically weren't success was considered finishing the model and having it touch the money, um, but you couldn't get that model checked in until the team that protected those models said you had done these 27 steps. There's literally 27 steps, and several of them were documentation related. So, uh, you know, you, it's it's a little heavy and a little burdensome, but uh, if you really believe in it, then you, then you do it because you know that it's going to pay dividends down the road. Uh, hi, Mac. Good talk. Thanks. <laughs> Um, anyways, one of the things you said that really resonated with me was uh, the idea that um, systems always lag reality, and I think that's, I've found that extremely true in, in my work, and so I guess my question was is do you have thoughts around sort of the meta system of how you maintain and update your system for knowledge management as circumstances require? Yeah, it's a very meta question. Um, but I think, especially for the end of the day on the second day, but um, I think the point is a little bit it's around how, like, can you weave this into where it happens um, so that, and make it reasonably agnostic. It's not, so there's, there's one way which is you have to use this tool. That's the only way that the knowledge is gonna get preserved. That tends to not work so well because people like to use a lot of different tools. Or it's, you can use any tool you want, but then you have to come back to the central place. And that means that people do the work, but it means that they either forget to come back to the central place, or if they do, they do it late, and so they leave crappy documentation. And I think that the meta answer is like split the difference and like let people use the tools that they want. I think. Things like the knowledge repo, honestly, a lot of what we're trying to do with Domino is like try to bring those as close to, together as you can uh, so that people can synthesize quickly and get rid of all the other. I mean, a lot of times people describe knowledge management as a tax. It's like we're paying these taxes because we know that ultimately we need taxes to like maintain a civilized society, or whatever the quote, it, quote is. Uh, but I think that like hopefully you can make the tax burden as low as possible and still let people then, and the other thing is let people see the benefit of it because the behavior starts to change more when they say, actually, I did benefit from this system. I did build on the shoulders of giants. And so that's another meta way to shift the sort of mindset. All right, we're done. We're done. Thank you guys. Thank Appreciate you. it. <laughs>